Okay, guys. Well, thanks for coming tonight. Um, we are um, uh, our organization is a not-for-profit mountaineering club, and one of our partners here is Bobcats Outdoor. This is Gregor, who's the owner. I want to give him a minute just to say hi and tell you guys what he has for you tonight. So. <laughs> As you probably all know, we just came here uh, a couple months ago. Uh, July 1st is going to change a lot. All of our main merchandise will be stuck in this place we look a lot different. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I have to move racks out of the way. Um, all the jackets you see and all the shoes right here are all 35% uh, off today. So you get to look at them during the entire presentation. <laughs> <laughs> on everything else okay okay thanks all right well um we're gonna start kind of simply um which is uh we'll look at the mountain just kind of as an entity and some history and fun stuff and then what I'm going to do is give you kind of an overview and then um, we'll go through the different routes. Now, there's a lot more routes on Whitney than I wanted to cover, and the majority of them are very technical. So you can always read about those in rock climbing books and so on. So, but the, the two that I'm going to focus on particularly are, of course, the Whitney Trail and the Mountaineers route. And then we'll also talk about the East Frontress, the East Face, and some other obscure routes you might not know about. Um, here on the table, feel free to pass these around. I have two very recommended maps. Uh, one of them is the Mount Whitney High Country Trail map um, by Tom Harrison. And um, this is a more of a large scale map that includes the JMT. And then the other one here, which I like better, is just the Mount Whitney zone map. So again, Tom Harrison, I've found them to be really useful <clears throat> for me. And the information is just around the edge, so it gives the maximum map space really clear for plastic so they won't rip and they're shaded relief maps also as a couple books you know i i've never actually seen this book that you mentioned Might I go back? um mount whitney one best hike so i don't think i can top this but <laughs> um maybe we'll provide some amusing anecdotes about other things other than the whitney trail this one you might want um if you're into the 14er thing, well, I think this is an older version, but this is a fantastic book, Climbing California's 14ers. So, you know, there's 15 peaks uh, in the state this high. So, um, it, Whitney is really well detailed in here, and it's got, of course, all the routes, all the history, and photos, and overlays, and so on. And then, if you're leaning toward or are a technical climber, um, Whitney's got some of the best High Sierra rock routes anywhere, specifically the East Face and East Buttress. So they're detailed, you know, and Keeler Needle too, they're detailed, not really move by move, but pitch by pitch. Um, and this is super topo. They make a lot of great climbing books. So I'll just, should I, do you want me to pass these around? Do you want to look at them? Okay. Do that. And how about I'll try to fold up the maps just a little bit. You guys can peer at those while we're. If you don't want to, just pass it on down. And the Mount Whitney zone map will be next. So you can look at the overlay and then it's smaller. Okay, Lene. And on to the next one. All right, let's turn off. Can you hit the lights right behind you right there? Yeah. Okay. Unless that's too dark. Nope. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. So uh, you want to climb Mount Whitney. I Now, <clears throat> here's a great photo of it. And I, Looking through the photos that we have and others um, online, there's so many photos of Whitney. I think on Summit Post, there's a thousand, one thousand four hundred photos, just the one, the good ones. It's very popular, if that's an indication. Um, why is it so popular? Because it's the highest peak in the continental U.S. So um, another reason is that it's ultra prominent. You guys know what prominence means? Anybody? <laughs> <laughs> it means, yeah, how high it rises from the surrounding landscape. So 10,079 feet, so that makes it the second most prominent peak in the U.S. Now, someone's going to ask me, what's the most prominent peak in the U.S.? I know it's not Shasta, because we talked about that one. I think that's the 11th. 
Um, it's probably either Rainier or San Gregorio, but I didn't have time to research that. So if someone finds out, let me know. Um, but in any case, when you stand on the summit, you're looking down a very, very long way to Owens Valley. Um, if you're afraid of heights, you know, the good news is it's not directly below you. It's kind of out in the distance, but it's a long way. So, and it's a beautiful view and a beautiful mountain. So, why climb it? It's a great climb. It's easy to get to relative to other summits that are that high. Um, so, how many people have been to the top already? Just show of hands. Yay. All right. More than once? Twice? Three times? Four times? Five times? <laughs> Uh, I played that game last time with the chess. But it's fun. Um, that's great. So it's worth it um, to go up there, and despite the hassles with lottery and lots of people and so on, it's great. Okay, let's go on to the next one. Okay, um, it's a long ascent. So uh, you know, a regular hike that's considered kind of strenuous would be probably four thousand feet. It's kind of a thumbnail. So this one is well over six. So if you do it in one day just a good way to do it so you don't have to worry about the lottery thing. You're going to be in for quite a challenge. It's 10.7 miles on the Whitney Trail to the summit. Does anybody know how long it is on the Mountaineers route? Yes? It's shorter. It's much steeper, right? It's like four miles. Okay. <laughs> so oh, we need to change the plans. That's right. <laughs> um, the summit is currently, I, I actually found a lot of controversy on this still, but most people agree it's 14.505 now. Um, yeah, and I do mean now. Um, we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. <laughs> and, and how many days? Well, you can do it in one day, everybody. You can plan three days or two. If you decide to do it in one day, just be really careful about altitude. Acute mountain sickness can set in pretty easily. Um, you go into Lone Pine at four-ish or so, and you drive up to Whitney Portal at eight, and then you're at trail camp at 11-ish, and then trail crest and the summit, and then pretty soon you've ascended 10 to 14,000 feet in one 20 mile period. That can really take a toll on you. So you feel, you know, I don't know later, but there's certain symptoms that come about, so watch out for those. Let's head on to the next slide. Okay, so some fun facts just to give you some colorful uh, history and understanding about it. How many of you know that Whitney, the highest point in the U.S., is only 76 or 84, depending on how you measure it, miles from the lowest point in the United States, which is like 200 feet below sea level? Yes, I'm going to mention that in a second. <laughs> okay, so uh, that's pretty astounding if you think about it. The lowest point and the highest point in the U.S. being that close together, um, essentially it's a factor of geography and geology. Um, the exact elevation, so here's the story on that. When it was first surveyed, they thought it was 14,494. Um, and so they put a marker on the summit. Um, the technology has advanced over the years. Um, along the way, the Forest Service put up a lot of great plaques and printed t-shirts, which you can still buy some that say it's 14,494.8611 feet. And then uh, the geodetic survey uh, revised their data from the 1929 datum. And in the 90s, they discovered that Whitney was actually 14,505. So it grew by 10 feet. So if you climbed it back then, you got to go back. Because now it's even higher. <laughs> Come on. Um, <laughs> there's a bunch of markers up there. Um, recently, taking the shape of the Earth into account and the distance and all of this stuff, they think it's more like 14,500. So if it matters to you, just build a rock pile, <laughs> stand on top of it, and come back down. Then you can cover all the elevations it has been and it needs to be, and make sure you got this on. Let's head on to the next one. So here's the Whitney Zone. Um, it is, like I mentioned, the most climbed high peak in Sierra Nevada, and so it gets its own zip code and regulations because of that. Anything inside of this zone is highly um, popular and is going to be permitted with the lottery system. Uh, except for any day hikes or routes that are not on the Whitney Trail. Um, the Whitney Trail, I think you guys know, it's, it's the most popular route to the summit. And so just a little bit of orientation. Um, your trailhead is going to be off the map here. Um, this one that I'm tracing here is the Whitney Trail. 
it comes to a junction right here with the lower portion of the JMT and then goes up to Whitney itself. Notice this other little obscure trail here that kind of seems to terminate at Iceberg Lake. What do you do then? This is this is the Mountaineers route up this side, okay? And East Face, East Buttress. We'll go through those as we get the next slides. Okay, so some more facts. Yeah, the Badwater Ultra Race. This is a fascinating event. So in its conception, someone thought, hey, let's run from the lowest point in the United States to the highest <laughs> point in the United States. So they do, and it's a hundred Right now, it's 135 miles, and they do hold it in July. I think oh on God. purpose, just to be bad. You know? <laughs> um, the Forest Service, in later years, they don't allow competitive events in the wilderness. So officially, it ends at Whitney Portal, but among the racers, it still unofficially goes all the way to the top. So they're climbing below 200 feet below sea level to 14,500. Um, and uh, doing that one way in July, they have a crew, they do it all together, um, I mean they do it all once. I looked at some of the fastest times, I think the, the world record at this point is 33 hours, so they run for more than a day. On the pavement out there, their shoes are melting, you know, they have a large fallout rate, 40 to 60 percent pending. Um, and there's just a few more minutes on this interesting race because um, they have not only run one direction, but some of the racers go back the other way, back to Badwater, thereby making it over 200 miles. And then some people want to do that again and go back up to the back up the summit. And then some people actually go back to Badwater again. And then some people want to do that solo, just without a crew. And so there have been people who have completed the Badwater Quad, which is lowest to highest, to lowest to highest, to lowest unassisted soul. <laughs> okay, so that's not for me. All right. So, um, still, you know, John Muir, uh, when he climbed this uh, Mountaineers route for the first time, he made this little quote, which I thought was quite apt. Um, Well-seasoned limbs will enjoy the climb of the Mountaineers route. He says 9,000 feet required for this direct route, but soft, succulent people should go the mule way, which is the way that you guys are signed up for, a lot of you. I'm sorry to tell you, John here does not approve. <laughs> but it's still a hard way to go anyhow. It's not the Backwater Ultra, but it's your own it's your own race, okay? So however you're doing it, it's okay. It's cool. So go ahead and just go on to the next one. Um, there's some other important people that have climbed it. One of them that I really find interesting is a woman named either Hilda or Hilda Crooks. Have you heard of her? Yeah. Grandma Whitney, okay, like it says here. She started climbing it in six, when she was 65, and she climbed it 23 times until she was 91. Um, they actually named this peak after her. It used to be called Day Needle, now it's called Crooks Needle. It was an act of Congress in 1990, so I thought that was really sweet. <laughs> She was very active. So while you're going up the mountain, just think a 91 year old woman. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. Let's go to the next one. Okay. So let's look at some of the geology and talk about how it's formed and what it is. Yes. We're just going to, I mean, you can read this, but I'll point them out as we go up. And then you want to trace me with the pointer. So this, this particular picture actually shows you the Mountaineers route. It comes up this steep canyon, goes through the ledges, which are infamous, to Lower Boy Scout Lake, Upper Boy Scout Lake. Then it would come around this way to Iceberg Lake. Then it would go up the gully to the notch of 14, and then the last 500 feet of the North Gully to the top. So that's Mount Whitney. <laughs> then we go down the ridgeline Keeler Needle, which has Yosemite-style climbs right here. And then, of course, Crook's Needle, okay, or Day Needle. And then some other minor points, which I don't know if a lot of people care about, but they have been all named. Agui is a French word, means needle. And then we're going to go over to Mount Mira, which is another 14er, which you can also tag on the way. Another interesting peak is Thor Peak. Mm -hmm. Right below that mountain is Thor Falls, which I'll show you. So, um, And all of these mountains are worth climbing, and they're all part of a huge batholith, which is a mass of granite that formed in the Cretaceous period, 
due to subduction, okay? And it cooled, and then it became a fault lock system. So what happens is, let's say that this is the west side, and this is where Whitney is now. The entire thing hinged like this, okay? So as it rose, the east side became more and more eroded with glaciers and rivers, and it peeled off all of the softer, uh, less erosion resistant dirt and rock and left granite bedrock. And so it's a wonderful rock to climb on. It's white, black and white pepper with little sparkles in it. So it looks amazing and it climbs like nothing else. It's lots of friction, straight cracks. It's awesome. So uh, go to the next page. Okay. So that it's all about the tilt, but what's amazing is that from 14.5 all the way down to the Alabama Hills, it's all the same rock. There's actually a fault in Owens Valley, way deep down that's in the Navy Lands. So although the Alabama Hills rock looks a little different, it's more reddish, more grainy, um, but this is all one big massive rock. So actually it is rising, but not quite as fast as the National Geodetic Survey says. So go on to the next one. Okay, a little bit of history. Here's some uh, famous characters here from my cheater sheet down here. This is Gardiner, Cotter, Brewer, and King. And I know that at least these three have mountains named after themselves. Um, the, the main uh, person to, to in this history that's fun is Clarence King, who is the head, the California geologist who is the head, trying to map and also actually summit Whitney. You may have heard this story. Um, when he saw Whitney, he wanted to be the first to climb it, but he came in from the west and he unsuccessfully had to re had to retreat. He wasn't he didn't make it that time. Uh, then he went out again in 1871, but he came from a different direction and. Uh, Sorry, but he accidentally climbed Mount Langley instead. <laughs> and when it was pointed out to him, he didn't believe it. Um, but it was then later on proven that, yes, you climbed the wrong mountain. So um, he's like, dang it. Well, he wanted to go again, but before he could do so, three fishermen from Lone Pine just went right up there. And they said, ah, we're going to name it Fisherman's Pee. <laughs> and they're like, no, you can't do that. I'm like, yes, we can. We climbed it. We're the first ascensionists. So for a while, it was called Fisherman's Pee. Um, but then the USGS says, no, 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 it's going to be Mount Whitney. So they just put the kibosh on that. And I think that people of Lone Pine have been a little bit um, upset ever since about their mountain. So, No, Whitney was named first before it was even climbed. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, he thought he was on Whitney, but. You know, his mapping skills, he was the first there and he probably had not good maps, so the ones he drew himself. So maybe, I mean, who can blame him, but you know, he kind of wrong map. Why did What's that? Why did I think, well, because Josiah Whitney was the prime benefactor, which I think is a word to say he was the money bags for the project. <laughs> so, you know, that's why he got the name. And poor John Muir got a little obscure peak off the side, which isn't really historic justice. But um, history isn't always fair. So anyway, Brewer got a tall peak too, and Gardiner's got a peak out there somewhere. And I, I think what caught it was. Let's go on to the next one. And those of you who are standing, I'm sorry, I did send out an email about bringing chairs, but I don't know if you guys got that. Or... Um, OK, uh, the, the residents of Long Pond, I think, decided that after all Whitney was a good thing. So they funded the first trail at the top. If you've been on the trail, you know it's a marvelous trail. It's wide, it's got steps, it's got plenty of switchbacks to make the, the grade really easy for you. You know, um, And what's interesting about this is that four days after the trail was opened in 1904, the first person died on Whitney. So there's been many since. And what was it? It was lightning, which is a common way to go up there. Uh, it was actually a U.S. Uh, government employee eating lunch who got zapped <laughs> at noon. Um, so they put this very uh, important sign up there. Um, despite the fact that Gustav Marsh, who did the trail, built this shelter on the summit partially protected from lightning, they tell you the Whitney shelter will not offer protection. You should leave the summit and proceed to a low elevation. So while you're enjoying the view, don't forget to look behind you where all the clouds come from. <laughs> they will approach quicker than you think. Soon would be in hailstorm or something. Even any time of year, it's this can happen. All right, let's go on to the next one. Okay, so let's get down to get down to it. 
There's a couple things it takes. One, obviously, is fitness. If you're going to do a day hike, this is going to be tough. Uh, so if you're going to gain you know, a lot of elevation, and it's a lot of switchbacks, over 100. There's one section that has 99, actually, so there's plenty more than that. Um, the trail is pretty long and difficult. It can be dry. There's only a few places to get water. So make sure that you've got camping and backpacking experience and know how to go light and fast, if you can. If you're doing any technical routes, of course, you have to know how to get there because it's not as well signed. And you're going to need some ability and skill to do so. So join our club and train with us, and we'll help you go up those routes if you want to do climb a lot, as well as the trail. Mm -hmm. So let's go ahead and run the next one. Um, I just want to put this in here that um, a lot of mountains we've talked about, like Shasta and Rainier, a lot of people have them on their bucket list, but you really have to train for these. There's no way around it unless you just bless with extraordinary cardiovascular endurance. Um, how do you do this? Well, two to three times a week, I would suggest doing this a couple months in advance. And not only are, is it going to be tough to get up there just physically because you're hauling a pack and you're doing a lot of work, but you're also going to have less oxygen at 14,000. Okay, so that will make a difference. At about 10, maybe sometimes 11 or 12, depending on your physiology, you start to wonder, why am I breathing so hard? And the reason is you're not getting as much oxygen with every breath, so um, that will take a little toll on you too. So do a workout, everybody. Make this worth your while by working on before you have going on. Okay, yeah, there's a couple things to talk about for permits. It looks like more than half the people who are already planning going have already got that figured out. That's probably the hardest part about climbing Mount Whitney, it's just the headache trying to figure out when you can go, if you can go. Um, if you stay overnight, you have to enter into a lottery, and it starts in May and ends at the end of October, I believe. Um, or you can do a day permit, which is a lot easier to obtain, but that means no camping. So 10.7 miles up to the top and all the way back down. Um, everybody who goes out there on every route anywhere inside the zone has to carry wag bags, and also bear canisters are also often a part of that. A wag bag is a poop bag. Okay, so, um, and then the Whitney Trail is the one that has the only lottery. Um, the others, you don't have to uh, go through that problem. But you still have, there's still a, a permit cap. So if you climb the Mountaineers route, for example, um, there's, I think either six or eight people or, that, are, that are allowed to go up per day. So you have to, have to climb. Yeah, sure. Uh, Yes, that's true. Yeah. Well, um, south of Lone Pine, there's the Interagency Visitor Center. Right. And they've got everything you want there. All the coffee mugs and t-shirts, <laughs> as well as your permits and the bear bags, I mean, and the, the, bear, box, the bear cans and the wag bags. I'll be certain to give those to you. And so that's where you go. You can also actually, you didn't know this, you can also pick them up outside of business hours, which I actually prefer. Just call in, tell them I'm coming in late. They'll put it in a box with the key, they'll give you the code, and you can just open it up, sign it, put it back in. Okay. Okay, so let's do some topography. You want to trace me? Okay, so we're going to start down here at our trailhead. The big red there, of course, is the Whitney Trail. So here's your first day. This is already starting to climb. Lone Pine Lake is the first one you'll see. Then you go through a really scenic place called Bighorn Park, which has got a little lake and uh, waterfalls coming down into it. Up here is Thor Peak to your right. It's pretty magnificent looking. You'll also go by Mirror Lake and then start climbing again. This is where most of the climbing happens in the first day. You won't be able to see Consultation Lake, but um, it's there off the left. It's usually covered in snow. Then right here, is trail camp, okay? There's a little lake there which you can get water out of, but I would probably filter it because there's so many people who are there, it's likely that it's not safe to drink from that lake anymore. Um, it's a windy place, um, so make sure that you have prepared for that and it can be snowy there until later in the year. Now, when you, if you decide to camp here, this is your first day. If not, this is new, okay? <laughs> so. Then you come to the, quote, capitalist switchbacks. There's 99 of them. You'd be cursing at that time you get to the top. 
But when you get to Trail Crest, you'd be like, wow, this is a great view. Um, this is where the JMT comes in. Then you have to traverse all the way across the ridge, and you think you're going to be there any time now, and it's not there yet. <laughs> Finally, you do get to the summit, 1400. Um, you'll see one thing that's kind of tough about this is that you're going to put a lot of work in right through the, the elevation zone where ANS is affecting you, and then you're going to spend a long time traversing right around 14,000. Um, so you're going to spend a long time at altitude. Not long time, but, you know, I mean, relatively long compared to. Mount Year's route, which is, you know, right here, you're at 13 or so, and then you go, whoosh, ah, come back. I mean, it's only <laughs> three hours you know, on your back down in Iceberg Lake. So that is one strategy that's nice about that. Next question. The people that do it all in one day, what time are they allowed to start? Oh, you can start any time. Um, you should certainly start before sunrise, long before, like maybe two in the morning, four in the morning at the latest, maybe. You know, I'd go earlier. I'd say start at midnight if you want to. So it's, it's not it's so cool. much a physical one physical <laughs> date that you're allowed. To, you're just not allowed to camp on it. So right. You keep moving. Yeah. No camping. <laughs> it could take you two days. As long I guess so. I hadn't really thought about you know, that. Either. You can only go in on your day. And you, you can start so earlier, but when you get to the zone, you have and your day starts at midnight. So your day starts at midnight. Okay. Okay. Lace up your tennies. Twelve oh one. Yeah. Well, and and there is an exit date too. Right. So exit, right? it's the same day you started, is it not? Yeah. Okay. I, there's nobody there taking names. Right. Okay. Yeah. So I'm not gonna say, oh, you're I'll late. One hour late. Uh, you know. <laughs> but yeah, you can't camp if you're on a day trip. Outpost camp? I'm not familiar with that one. Does anybody know where it is? Because I only know trail camp, and I know we're hard like. Oh, so that must be the one that's down here near Lake. Yeah, that's right about here at Mirror Lake. Okay. I know that name. And Mirror Lake, I'm just thinking, I'm not that Well, you know, usually I'm an advocate of of, filter, of filtering any place below Timberline, especially on popular routes. Yeah. So, just for perspective, um, Mount Carillon is here, Mount Russell is there. So let's come down to, so that has our target. Let's start here, going up the trail, North Fork of Long Pine, Ebersbacher Ledges are right here, Lower Boy Scout Lake, at the base of Mount Thor, Thor Falls, Upper Boy Scout Lake, this is typically where you camp. You can go up all the way up to Iceberg, which is I think 12-ish, 12 and a half perhaps. Uh, I don't recommend that because AMS is likely to occur if you do that. So anyway, we're going to start at Upper Boy Scout Lake. We leave definitely before dawn, once again, 2 to 4 a.m., climb through the ledges, go 1,000 feet up the snow and rock chute, and then the last 500 feet. So that's the mountain range route. This prominent prow right here is the east buttress. This is the east base. Okay, And all the others are over five knots. So that means really tough in rock climbing terms. Especially at 14,000. Here is a little close up on those. Um, I mean, they're pretty well traced out, but Mountaineer's route takes the low road to the gully, and the East Face route takes the high, very exposed route up the base, very um, exhilarating. At this point right here, the fresh air traverse, I'll talk about that a little bit later on, there's about a thousand feet of air directly below you under the glacier. Um, the other route in between them is called the East Buttress, which is my favorite. It climbs this beautiful spiny prow, and basically uh, these two, what's really fun about those two routes is pulling up over the top with all of your gear on and finding people eating their sandwiches, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, are those rock climbing routes? Or are they, yes. They are. Yeah. They're, okay. This one is 5'7". And this one is 5'8", but I think those are a little bit high. They're really more like 5'5", five, 5'6". Five, five, so doable, but you know they ascend 1,000 feet of technical rock. So they're great adventures. We'll talk about those in turn as we go down the presentation. Let's go to the next one. OK, so let's get to the main thing, the Whitney Trail. Once again, I traced it out for I found a photo that traced it out for you. I didn't do this. Um, so let's go through our landmarks one more time. This would be Wotan's throne. This would be Thor Peak. 
okay? So coming down from the top, summit, the needles, you know, mirror, the switchbacks, trail camp, consultation lake, mirror lake, down through, okay, Lone Pine Lake, I think I'm sorry, I missed it, it's right about there, and then, so, there you are. And then, uh, Mount Mears route, one more time, this is the, this is Lone Pine, North Fork Lone Pine Creek, the ledges, upper, excuse me, lower, upper, iceberg, and home. Um, the potential camps for the Whitney Trail, um, on the maps that I was passing around, you'll note that the JMT comes from the west. That's Guitar Lake. That would be, that's the traditional camp there. Someone was doing that over here, okay? So that's where you would leave your pack and your tent. And then you'd come back and get that and climb back up again, unless you can find somewhere to stash that up. So you have to look into that. Um, but from the other side, trail camp, uh, or outpost if you want to be lower those are the caps that are recommended and there's not a lot of room in trail camp so another reason i i recommend that you start early so that you can get the site you want um, so it's a long way um 10.7 miles and then like i said 6,000 feet um is, is this trail kind of like the Whitney trail is that the only the only route on the mountain that doesn't require ropes and no, uh, the Mountaineers route does not require ropes either, it doesn't? but it does have class three scrambling. Um, some people use ropes on it and some don't. Okay. And then there's a whole slew of North Face routes, some that have names and some don't, that also are scrambling routes. So I guess I would clarify saying this is the only hiking route. Mm -hmm. All the others are scrambling routes and then at some point when they become fifth class, then they're considered rock hiking routes. So, for some of us who are not so much um, class three fits into the 5.75, like that's class five, right? Right. So class one would be walking in the mall. Uh, class two would be a trail, rough trail perhaps. Class three would be two feet in the hand. So that's scrambling. Class four would be tough scrambling, both feet, both hands. And class five would be a rope, five points. Would you speak with male care at all on the way up? Uh, it's a side trip because at that point the trail is veering to the west, so you have to go out of your way to tag it. It's easy. You can get up there in about 20 minutes. And then at the very top, there's just a little scrambling. I think it's about faster. I was going to say the population is faster. Yeah. Like it's almost like once you're up, if you're up there and want to get it, it'd be a shame to go all that way. Yeah, I think so too. So. Uh, but that's class three. Yeah. Exposure up there, not it's not too bad until you get right to the tip. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, let's continue on. Let's look at some pictures. Okay, so first one, this side. This is the beautiful valley you're coming by. This would be the side of Thor right here. So this is just before you get to what you guys were calling outpost camp after Long Pine Lake. This is your first three miles or so. Uh, on the way up, you're going to pass beautiful waterfalls like this and cliffs that continue around to Mount Irvine, Mallory, and the rest of the granite path of it that's out there. Continue on. Um, when you get to trail camp, already talked about that a little bit, um, you're going to be looking up at the switchbacks. Here's a nice <laughs> view of two uh, parts of it you ought to know about. One is look how tight they are. So they really go up quickly and they're just one after the other. That's looking down on them. There's one part where they have a railing built into it. And this is often discussed on forums as the scary part of the trail <laughs> because the snow comes on to this and it's kind of a slabby thing, which is why they put the railing there. Um, but uh, some people bring trail spikes, crampons, it depends. Um, one thing that happens there that's kind of unusual is because so much foot traffic goes through there, the snow gets compacted really quickly and it turns to ice. So um, people have been surprised by how hard this the underfoot the footing is there, the ice. Okay, so if you don't know what I'm talking about, you know, crampons are on the wall over here. Those are just plain old spikes that you fit on your boots for climbing, ice climbing, snow climbing. There's kind of an intermediate version, trail spikes is what I've heard them called, 
Um, and they are lightweight and will help you get through something like this without having a strap on it. You know, full ice climbing tampons on. So that's a good way to go. Especially since you'd have a railing here. If you're going to be on the trail and you expect to have ice, then that would be good. So the, is there still ice there? In August? <laughs> no, yeah, no. Definitely yeah. not. Right now? Yeah. Probably not. Yeah. Probably not. There's a forum at the moment that says there was some. There was some? Okay. Heard the forum. Yeah. I don't know what some means. People use the spikes? Yeah, okay. The spikes. Yeah, they say waste a little. I mean, you know, right? I haven't. I haven't been in the Whitney Portal store. Um, I don't think they can. Very we called the Whitney Portal store and they do have them available. Oh, really? But okay. he did say when we called that we wanted them. Okay. Oh, really? Um, yeah. When are you going to be just called this year? Okay. Mm -hmm. So yesterday they said you don't need them anymore? Okay. It's supposed to be, it's um, going to be 106 on Saturday in Bishop. <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay. So. It'll probably look like this, okay, for you. So those of you who are going this way. All right, let's continue on. So Trail Crest is a really neat place where the trails come together, okay? And you can start to see down the west side for the first time. Um, it's a little marker right here that will let you know where you're at. And you can uh, see down to Guitar Lake and then see what the rest of your route looks like, which is the next slide, like this. So this is looking back south from near the summit across here to Eagle Crooks and beyond. So when you come up, you're going to be right here. This is where Trail Crest is. Okay? That's New York. These are all the Yagis. Okay? That's Crooks. And that's Day. I'm sorry, Keeler. And that's, that's you. <laughs> <laughs> Going across miles of talents, but it's got a great view. Yeah, it goes to rock just like that. It's very well traveled, so no problem. Let's continue on to the next one. Okay. So that was that was what I had for you for the Whitney Trail. Is there any questions or clarifications on that for me on the mountain trail? Who that trail the mountain? It was uh, the same guy who built the Smithsonian hut on top and the residents of Lone Pine in connection with the Forest Service. So it took him a long time, a couple of years. Is it really well marked? It's the most well marked trail in California. <laughs> <laughs> the widest backcountry highway we've ever seen. You can walk three or four abreast all the way up the whole thing. So. For those coming from Guitar Lake, that's the way we did it. We took our packs up to Trail Crest and then took a bay path and we just dropped our packs at Trail Crest. So that is okay? Summit to Everybody does that. I haven't come that way. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I mean, they're just all lined up there. Okay. Kind of like all right, there's your answer. Yeah. Okay, so take your pack of truck. Don't leave it those yeah. yeah. Okay. okay thanks. It's just that sometimes the marmot eats, eats part of your pack. Oh. Well, I'm my bear canister. Right. So, yeah. <laughs> right. I don't worry about being canister. Not a canister. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. So is this trail pretty narrow or is it wide? It's wide. Very well traveled. So it's a great one. Any others? Yeah. Teaming County, how many times have you done it? Have I done Whitney? Yeah. About eight. eight. Yeah. But my confession is that I've never gone all the way up the Whitney Trail. I've yeah. gone all the other routes <laughs> on all the other sides. Um, so I have made it to Trail Camp and then we took a technical route up Mount Muir. So this is my favorite route, not because of the name, because it's a fantastic way to get to the top, requires less fussing with permits, and isn't as difficult as you think. Um, it's the Mountaineer's route. It is at the same trailhead. Um, you camp it up at Boy Scout Lake, like I said. It's got the same you know, ascent, but it's class three, which is gonna involve a little bit of scrambling. I'll give you some photos of what it looks like on top. Um, the one thing about it that is I think kind of partly my opinion, but from having pardoned enough, I'll say that it's pretty well justified. You don't want to be in the main gully in a snow free condition because it's a thousand feet of really loose talus that's inclined at a good angle. So climbing parties above you will inevitably send down rocks which you'll have to dodge. So that's why it's faster and safer to climb it when it's snowy. 
Um, also, if, if you do it before May 1st, um, my favorite time to go is the last part of April. No, it is June, I'm telling you this. <laughs> but next year, right? Um, the last part of April before the quota season, then you can you can just go. And it's the perfect conditions typically then. So this is a look from close to 14, looking down the gully. You can see it's not excessively steep. Um, this is no, no doubt a guided party. They're the only ones that rope up for this. Everybody else just goes up there with my sacks, crap on the helmet. Um, so that's that's what I would do. Is let's go to the next page. Uh, so here's some of the things you see along the way. Two, well, one tricky spot is these ledges, the Eversbacher ledges. So um, if you do go, contact us. We've got some pretty clear markers we can help you with to know exactly where this is, but. It's a nice little switchback on itself that climbs above some sandy ledges. This is the very worst part where it's kind of narrow and drops off for about 150 feet on this side, maybe more. But it just kind of climbs up through these ledges, um, and then you get up against the wall of that. Um, it's a pretty sweet view and, and a nice little scramble. And then along the way, um, especially in April or you know, early summer, you see these amazing uh, two-tier ice falls here, which we, we climb, and they're pretty fun to practice on. So you can get to camp, go ice climbing, and the next day you can climb with them, which is a great one, too. So those are, sorry, those are options? So those are between trip. upper and lower Boy Scout Lake. The lower falls, though, is that like, you have to know your shoes that, or you could? No, no, it's just a, something fun. you go by and go, woo, next time I'm bringing ice tools. <laughs> <laughs> so this is what it looks like at upper Boy Scout Lake such a scenic place. Does anybody know what this thing is back here? Is another 14er? No, the other one. Russell. Russell, right. This is Mount Russell. This is Fish Hook Red, Metro Dihedral, the Easter Red, and all of these amazing rock routes here. Um, this is another pass you can go through to access routes on the north. These don't have names. And I think people might have climbed them, but they're impressive enough. So you're in this really high cirque. Um, nice place to camp. The water is pretty good. And uh, you see there's nice little tent sites, a lot like trail camp. Let's go on to the next one. So, um, leaving early, you'll arrive at Iceberg Lake around dawn. And this is the view that you're going to have. You can see how much closer you are to Whitney. It's right there. Um, the chute to go up is either of these two. Most people take this one. And they can you trace me with this. Um, most people, this is the start of the Mountaineers route. It's a 35 degree snowshoe. This takes you to 14,000 right here. Mm -hmm. So at that point, you're really close to the sun. Go to the next one. So this is what it looks like without snow. Um, this is the, the chute looking down on Iceberg Lake. Lo lo I'm sorry, lo lots of routes to go through there. Father, these people now on this side. <laughs> so, uh, and then what's really neat if, if you have a, someone you know or you guys do a split party, the East Buttress route is right here. So you can sometimes see each other, you know, a couple thousand, 1,500 feet apart. Um, look right down on them. Hey! So it's really a fantastic place. Go to the next one. So this is what the North Gully looks like in April conditions, probably in a low snow year. Uh, it's not really steep, but some if you get off route like up here, I would say that would turn into a more fourth and fifth class. And there's a lot of loose rock here, so if you just stay right in the center, and just go up to it, um, should be just fine. Uh, this is only up to 500 feet. Some people say it's more like 300 feet of climbing. Yeah. And nice, nice way to finish up. Yeah, that's the class three gully. This is what the class three gully looks like in more like March. So another reason you might want to climb it when there's snow is it's just easier. There's less rock, you know. And because the snow will be deep, you'll have better footing. You won't have to worry about climbing ice or compacted snow. You just you will be post holding, but um, if it's a good winter. Um, but it's in some ways safer and more straightforward to do it with snow, which is probably ironic, but. Um, that's my favorite way to do it. There is a, this is a, probably about 50 feet below the top out point. One thing that's really cool about this route is you can look all the way down to Arctic Lake, which is about 
2,000, 3,000 feet below you on this chute. So one caution, if you do do this in a season where you can slip, um, there have been quite a few people who have not made the turnoff, oh, here's the turnoff right here, back to the mountain edge route, uh, and have just kept on going down the way against their will. Okay. <laughs> so that's not a good way to go, but this it's a great route nonetheless. Let's go to the next one. Yeah, <laughs> they missed the turn. Right. Okay, so the East Buttress, probably one of my most favorite rock routes um, in the Sierra. Uh, Lene, you want to trace this with me? So essentially it starts the same place at the East Face, and it's a little bit off the picture here actually, but you know, no, no surprise, it's going to follow this crest all the way up. This is the Pee Wee. Uh, it's a, it kind of looks like a huge bug crawling up on the side of Whitney, and it's just, just overhanging flake. It's just still attached somehow miraculously, and then finishes up at the top. East face climbs through this section over here. We'll do that one next. So a grade three, which means it's going to take most of the day. Um, it is a thousand feet of spectacular granite from 13 to 5 to 14. Six to nine pitches, depending on where you rope up and how far you stretch the rope. So a pitch would be 200 feet, okay? And because it wanders just a little bit, you know, the math is a little off, but it's about a thousand feet. Um, and they do say it's 5A, but I say, you know, most of the pitches uh, are around 5, 6, and third and fourth class is something between hiking and rock climbing. So it's scrambling. And that's what you're going to encounter for the last pitch or two, depending on how comfortable you are here. And the first one or two, depending on which start you take. Let's go to the next one. So here's just a, a couple of photos to explain what I was talking about. Here again, Mountaineers route, and then right up the wall, you can see the climbers on the crest. Um, this alternate approach cuts off two pitches, which I'd recommend starting on this side. So two pitches here, pitch three, pitch four. Peewee's going to be right about there, and then amazingly, there's still more pitches after that. I think this foreshortened view doesn't do you justice, but there's at least two or three more pitches, I agree, I think, of technical climbing, and then one or two more up here. So, let's go to the, oh, okay, and this is, this is the start that they're not showing you that's on this side. Okay, go to the next picture. So, I, at pitch four, this is what you're looking at here. This is how you came up, right through here there up this slab and then if you turn around and face the camera the other direction this is what you have yet to go so pretty spectacular choice go to the next page okay the east face um both of these routes east buckers and east face were a disappointment to the early pioneers who climbed it. they were looking for beautiful direct lines they were expecting super hard rock climbing and the story of the east buttress first descent is that they only put three pitons on it they climbed it and then they down climbed it after that so these were people like dawson underhill um, and the like who pioneered these routes and they thought this route was fun but after they completed they went on to other hard routes the rest of us normal humans still climb these routes and like them <laughs> um, it's not ne necessarily difficult because there's only a few spots people actually unrope on a lot of this amazingly but it's got some uh really uh, iconic route moves and sections like the washboard which is a slab you fall a crack up to um, the fresh air traverse which i already mentioned i'll show you a picture here in a second and then the grand staircase and the chimney so grade three most of the day let's turn to the next one so here's the fresh air traverse i wish i could find a better picture of it um, but if you can just picture standing right here and going through blocks, and this is dropping off pretty much straight down. The rest of your route is up through here. This is what sort of exposure you're looking at, looking down from the top of the chimney. That is the glacier straight down there. This is the moraine. So if you just hooked a rock off this, it would drop all the way to the bottom. Probably take a couple seconds. Let's go to the next one. Okay, so that's it for technical routes, and then here's some less known routes in North Face. So to orient yourself, um, what I was just showing you, the East Buttress and the East Face, come up this side. Okay, so obviously we're looking north now, right? This would be west, 
the Mountaineer's route comes up this gully and the, lock, the notch is right about here. So if you went through the pass by Upper Boy Scout Lake and went towards Arctic Lake, which is between Whitney and Hale, you have all of these routes available to you which are all scrambles. Uh, most of them follow ribs up on the side. It looks like this section here, which is just west and a little bit north of the Mountaineers route is a favorite place to go. I haven't climbed any of these routes. So I'm just passing in information to you about them. But certainly a way that you could come where you'll see far less traffic. And probably a good way to go for skiing. Um, when they did the first traverse of the Sierra by skis, this is the way that they came up on this side. Any skiers in here? A few? Okay. So that's the uh, North Face routes. Any questions about the last four routes I just made through? <laughs> Oh, is that that chimney you're talking about on the East Face? Is there a pretty good pro on that, or is it? Yeah, it's got good pro. I like it, the pro list says hexes, stoppers, nuts. Those are all non-mechanical yeah. types of protection that you use for routes. You're not really too concerned about a huge fall. Um, and because it's granite, most of the cracks are pretty parallel sided. Mm -hmm. As long as you can find sound rock, you should be able to do so. A lot of people end up just scrambling portions of it. Mm -hmm. Other questions or comments on the uh, routes? No? Okay, all right, let's go on. So I have a, a few more things to just talk about. Um, uh, this is kind of uh, uh, just a discussion on clothing and equipment. Um, some of this is going to be less relevant because um, this is for mountaineering in general, so I'm going to modify some of it. But a lot of it um, still pertains to any time you go up to a mountain this high, you're going to want to be prepared. You don't want to leave behind your shell jacket. You don't want to leave behind, um, you know, an extra set of socks. You want to have enough layers to protect yourself against the cold and unexpected weather. And the types of things that you want to carry are like this list here. They're all man-made materials except for wool. Okay. Notice cotton not on the list. Okay? <laughs> not even for your underwear if you can avoid it. Okay. Um, for layering, because that's the key, the magic thing is that to have lots of light layers instead of thick, huge layers. Um, I'm recommending two for everything except for your upper body. It'd be nice to have three layers. Exactly what those are made of and how you wear them depends. Let's go on to the next one. Look at that a little bit. So you guys know some of this, I hope. Um, most outdoorsy folks know about the base layer, mid layer, shell layer system. So. This wicking first layer is thin, should move moisture out to the second layer. Second layer is a barrier between the outer layer and the inner layer. And so it can be the one that's the most flexible, it could be almost any sort of fabric or thickness. The outer layer, the shell jacket, especially in Sierra, doesn't need to be super robust, but it should be windproof and waterproof, or at least water resistant, and I recommend it. Um, it's nice also to have a puppy that fits over all of this or underneath your shell layer if you choose to go that way. So that would actually technically be four layers. Um, two pairs of wool socks I recommend and light gloves. Um, you won't need glacier glasses. Um, but I would bring not only a sun hat, but also a beanie, watch cap, tooth, whatever you call that sort of round item you put on your head. <laughs> I would bring one of those for sure. That would be your two headwear, headgear items and don't forget sunglasses let's go to the next one mm -hmm. so here's what we're talking about for um, wool socks and gaiters probably won't need these if there's no snow but um they do make trail gaiters which keep the debris out of your boots i find those to be useful they're really uh, small and made out of neoprene or actually uh, soft shell often um how many of you hike let's talk about socks for a second how many of you hike with liners no liners. Okay, I've been on both camps and currently I'm in no liner territory. I think it depends on the fit with your boot. Um, one of the things that dethrones a lot of people from standing on the top is uh, it's blisters. So make sure that you've got well fitting boots and you can air your feet. It takes the swelling down by putting them in something cold like a lake. If you can do that, or change your socks out even mid hike, or change your liners and your socks out. Um, pay attention to commercial insoles that go in boots. They can lift your heel up and cause blisters. We had an incident with that just two weeks ago. 
um, we were planning a trip through Palisades, go in for six days, and one of our one of our partners um, just put new insoles in his boots, and he blew out his heels at three miles and had to stay there or go back to his car. It was a bummer for him. So test it out before you commit to the trail. Okay, that's Let's go to the next one. Let's skip one. Let's go back. So just a few examples. You know what base layers are supposed to do for you. This is nice. It's it's nice to have the short or long sleeve. I think a zip is nice because it protects your neck. You lose a lot of heat right here. It's one of your major heat zones. So um, one or two pair, depending for underwear, and then um, a sun shirt is kind of a new thing. But um, some of the base layers they're making now are so thin they're like SPF. 70 or something like that. They actually have a hood that zips up. It sounds hot, but it bends really well. So you don't have to worry about sunscreen. Um, and that actually keeps you cool. So let's go to the next one. So mid layer, like I said, it can be fleeced, soft shell, down. Um, get something that's fairly thin, I think, because it's going to be in between items. And it's nice to have a jacket that is somewhat water resistant, like some of these here. Um, no, this is this is kind of a nice water resistant fabric. Okay, you can tell if it's water resistant or even waterproof, but if it's seam taped. And then for your pants, um, a lot of folks like nylon hiking pants. Those are probably a good choice, but soft shell is also a good choice because it's stretchy and warm. And then for your second layer, you just want the standard probably rain pants, wind pants. That should do it for you. I think a pair of shorts would also be appropriate depending on if you type hikes and shorts. But don't stop there. I have seen people show up by the time we were there in November at trail camp. We had our puppies on and we had our down bags laid out and some hikers were coming to trail camp in shorts. Mm -hmm. They looked really cool, real cool. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so stop and change your clothing on the way up because every foot, every thousand feet you go up in elevation, you lose three degrees. So just on average so let's go to the next one so this is this is this is probably an overkill example of jacket but you want again water resistance and windproof which is just as important let's go to the next one okay what is this item what do you call this balaclava okay right ski mask i've heard it called um in place of a toque you can take one of these which covers your neck it's more like you know hood that you put on. They sell a really cool item, sometimes called a buff, which is like a convertible headband, uh, neck gaiter thing that you can wrap all around yourself. Those are really um, versatile. Uh, and then the sun hat. All right, let's go to the next one. Glasses, goggles. No, not this time. Let's go on to the next one. A few gloves, just something nice and thin, soft shell should work pretty good. Unless you have cold hands, then you can go ahead and go gauntlet length, cold finger gloves. Let's go to the next one. So here's an example of the puffy I was talking about. It's kind of a, I guess it's more of a mountain thing, um, not so much for just standard backpacking, but it's catching on. I know a lot more people are wearing this sort of item. A down jacket like this, with or without a hood is a really indispensable item in California where it's dry. This will give you lots of warmth for its weight. It's so lightweight, I think it's a good idea to have something like this long. And if you do spend those those early morning starts or if you got benighted on the route, that's a nice item to have. It's going to compact down to a small size. And it's kind of an it's kind of this um, you know trap hits the fan sort of an item where you call them and you can't do anything about it. Soft shell is not something I want to tell you guys about that maybe you haven't heard of before. I don't know what your experience is, so I'm not going to make any assumptions. But it basically, when I was climbing and hiking in the 90s, it was all about fleece. That was the new thing. So I had fleece socks, fleece shirts, <laughs> fleece pants. And then um, they came out with soft shell, which is a blend of nylon and spandex. Okay? So let's see if I can find one here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a soft shell right here. Okay, it's not fleece. It's not. Um, it's not you know waterproof nylon. It's water resistant. This one is not taped, so it's not waterproof. 
but what's great about it is it's thin, it's stretchy, and it's warm. Okay, so they're amazing, especially for pants and mid-layer jackets. If you get a if you get a uh, soft shell that is seam taped, and I've already mentioned two or three times, then you've actually got a mid-layer that can function as an outer layer, which is how I that's the way I like it. So what's not to like about that? Let's go to the next one. Okay. <laughs> what are you going to take to Mount Whitney? Um, how much do you really need? That's the good question. Um, uh, packs. Forty. How, how big is a 40 liter pack? I, mean, I don't know, Gregor, if you could help us find a 40 liter pack off the wall, if you can pick one up. There's a lot of 75s and a 50 or 40. This is your goal. Your goal is to fit in a 40 liter pack for the weekend. Okay? For the weekend. Okay? It's you know a pack that's going to be a little tight. So you're going to have to think carefully about how many items you want to carry. Probably the way I look at it is you take the liters and you turn that into pounds. Okay? So if you're carrying a 50 liter pack, you're going to land somewhere around 50 pounds if you're not careful. 40 liter pack, 40 pounds. 30 liter pack, 30 pounds. So I would go for a 40. I probably have a standard backpacking pack if you haven't deliberately gone this small, is going to be between 50 and 75. A lot of them are 75. So empty, how much does that pack weigh? Four pounds? Okay. Empty, a 40 liter pack is going to weigh a pound and a half. So right then you're going to lose three pounds. And because you don't have the space, you're going to have to start thinking really critically about what to take. So my advice is take some chances on smaller mountains if you have the time. I know some of you are leaving right away. But, um, and try to figure out how you can make a weekend out of a 40 liter pack. Um, so that's my, that's what I'm thinking. Uh, sleeping bag, this is relevant, 15 degrees. That's a good. That's a good one to have. Unless you sleep cold, then you're going to want one that's more like zero. But um, if you take a thirty, uh, if you take a freezing level bag, then you're probably end up wearing some of your clothes. As far as this tent thing, that's not true. You don't need a four season tent for nothing. But you did. You should still properly anchor it and guide it. Um, stoves. A lot of people take canister stoves. White gas is something you may consider. It burns hotter, longer. Can be compressed all the way to the end, the last drop. You just have to learn how to prime the stove. Um, it's a little heavier. So, but it's going to burn just the same up at trail camp as it will down at the port. So, I like having that along, especially if you have to melt snow for water. Um, trekking poles are a great thing to have along. You know, when you, anybody climb, anybody hike with those? Hike or climb trekking poles? A good bunch of you. Okay. So, at least 20% of your weight is taken by your arms with these trekking poles. So it's like pulling a couple pounds out of your pack. And it's much easier on your knees, too. So I recommend those. A couple other things. Uh, an altimeter is really uh, nice to have. At least one in your party or a GPS. And if there's any snow involved, it's nice to have a shovel. So you can excavate tent sites, get snow for water, or dig yourself out. Right? <laughs> All right, Linnea, let's go to the next one. So uh, day pack, weekend, and extended packs. Um, you're going to want to try to go for a weekend pack unless you're spending a long time climbing Whitney. <laughs> um, so this is what I was trying to tell you. It, you know, this is uh, 30 to 40 liters is, is light. Uh, 40 to 55 is typical size. 55, I call those beast of burden packs. Um, Try to just bring your weight down because that's the key thing that's going to help you have a better experience. You're going to enjoy the trail more. You're going to go faster, less damage to your body. Um, and as far as climbing goes, and anything that's like Whitney, it's nice if it's tall and slim. It can be stripped down. It doesn't have any extra stuff on it. And if you can uh, if you can attach things to the outside, that's the only way to get away with a 40 liter pack. So that not everything has to fit inside. Some of the stuff can be strapped to the outside. And then you leave. Uh, those things that are strapped to the outside, you leave them at your camp and just take just what you need for the sun push. 
then you don't have to take two packs or carry a four pound pack with something. Yeah. yeah. If you're taking a 40 meter pack in for the weekend, then and you're, say, camping at trail camp, mm -hmm. what would you typically take to the summit, though? Well, you're not going to be bringing much anyway, right? So you're going to definitely need your tent, your sleeping bag, and your mat. Right. Okay. Pretty much everything else you're, you're going to be bringing. That, say, you're not taking that pack on the summit, right? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. So some people would have a pack for the approach and then some other smaller thing to go to the top. So I'm saying if you buy, if you, you, you can use a 40 liter pack, especially if it's climbing type pack, and you can actually take that one and a half, two pound pack and it'll be less full and you can strip it down. You can take the frame sheet out, take the waist belt off, take the top lid off, that'll cut another half a pound off of it. And just take what you need for that eight to 10 hours you're gonna be on the trail. So. It's a good way to go. You can, you can swing. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. So as far as sleeping bags go, um, it doesn't really matter if you have synthetic or down, as long as it's good for you. And um, the one thing to know though is that if you experience any moisture, down bag is is going to deflate and will not keep you warm. Um, as far as mats go, in terms of deflation. Um, if you bring an air mat and it loses its air, then you're on the ground in the cold. So sometimes it's nice just to have an insulite pad that it has no possibility of going, getting popped. Then you know that you'll get a good night's sleep and you can also pull it out of your tent and sit on it on the rocks in the cold. If you have an emergency, you can cut it up and use it for something. These are all the great reasons why insulite pads are found. Um, let's go to the next one, which is also known as a closed cell phone. Uh, tents, really, uh, this this is a little overkill. So I'm saying that three season tents will work for us. Um, do you guys know about single wall tents? Have you heard of those before? A couple heads. Okay. So the typical tent has got an inner, probably mesh structure, and then it has, of course, a fly which fits over the outside. So the the small, you know, those come in small sizes and they get down pretty pretty low in weight. But there's another versions of tents that are out now, which are also small, but even lighter. And they actually just have a single wall. There is no fly. So there's one right behind you on the wall over there. It's a two-person tent. Um, and it's a Himalayan grade, four-season tent. It's a single wall, and it weighs five pounds. So that's a heavy one. Okay. So if you buy a single wall tent, it is only a two-person. And it's like sleeping in a closet with somebody. But it's a single wall tent. It'll pack up to this big. Two person tent, two and a half pounds. Black diamond first light is an example. So we use these types of tents for climbing a lot because they aren't as they aren't as uh, waterproof, but they're so light that most of the time they're awesome, and we really appreciate the small nature of them. So this is an example of a single wall tent here with the vestibule, and they do great for snow and altitude. No, fully waterproof. No, they're not. They're not fully waterproof. But they're water resistant enough. And especially if you're up high, you know, where it's likely that it'll snow instead of rain, that's not a disadvantage. So it's not. That's an EV2. So it's really durable and still five pounds. I mean, that's a Himalayan ring. It's a lot of money. Um, <laughs> that particular one would be retail 600 somewhere around there but this type um the uh not himalayan grade but still um, good four season um single wall tent like the first light i think it's around two three hundred so it is a little bit more but you're shaving a lot of weight a lot of pounds off of, off your so it's something to consider okay next so here's an example of what i'm talking about canister stove one person system. If every one person carries this system, that's not very efficient. Whereas if you have a white gas system with a large pot, then you could have cooking for everybody. And because you can pressurize the bottle of the burn pot all the way to the last one. Um, yeah, yeah, it takes some time, but it's worth learning. Actually, we have videos teaching how to do this. So, all right, go to the next one. Food. What are you going to eat? 
Um, that, now, this is a touchy subject uh, because everyone has different preferences, but <laughs> think about a couple things. Number one is you don't want to carry anything that's heavy. Okay, I know that. Okay. But what I mean, so that means if there's water in your food, you don't need it. Therefore, that's going to put you more towards dehydrated, freeze dry, so on. They do make tasty meals you can survive on. They're actually okay. Um, to And uh, you just rehydrate, put the water in. You have to wait 10 minutes while you're thinking about how this is going to taste. <laughs> <laughs> All you need to take is a spoon, okay? And uh, a cup, that would function as your bowl. So forget the plates, the forks, the mess kit, all that stuff. Just take a cup and a spoon. That's all you need. Um, so this is an example of a dehydrated meal. This one um, is just something else I'm showing you from the grocery store. You could cook, you know, rice, hummus. Everything comes dehydrated if you go to the right places. You can have a gourmet meal and not bring anything heavy up there. Does anybody know what the the champion is for calorie to weight ratio in terms of that has the most calories per pound. What is it? Olive oil. Olive oil? Yeah. I was about it was bacon. Uh, That's right. <laughs> Olive oil. Okay. Cool. Oh, maybe I'll have to do that. Um, so, yeah. How about olive oil? How about olive oil fried and I mean, bacon fried? <laughs> That'd be a good. I like that. I like bagels with bacon fried in butter and cheese and then another bacon fried bagel on top of that. That's like 3,000 calories, only a few ounces. So you can also, I don't know if I consider this extreme nutrition, but it's very readily available and you've heard of it, like you know, the carbohydrate syrup packets, give them a shot. But they also come in now gels and goos and gummies and all kinds of other configurations. So. My strategy is I don't bring more than one of anything, even even trail bars. I have all kinds of flavors, all kinds of brands, mm -hmm. all kinds of options because I know I'm going to take a bite and go, oh, I don't like that, but i got to finish it. Okay, oh, let's do something different. Okay. <laughs> I like that, but i got to finish it. Okay, let's do something different. But if I have to eat just Snickers bars, I'm going to hate <laughs> them. So bring different things. Another, another way that people um, often take too much weight is they take too much water with them. So it weighs a lot, two and a half pounds per liter. So instead of carrying four liters up the mountain, I would carry three quarters to a half, like a liter bottle, and carry a foldable platypus that's a reservoir for when you need to obtain water for camp. But along the trail, only do a hike with more than a liter. And then you need to take a break anyway, just stop by the stream. If you use a filter, Fill your bottle up again, and on the trail, there's lots of places to fill up. Lots of lakes, lots of rivers. Lots of rivers. Any questions? What yeah. Is the last chance on, the water? on the Whitney Trail? Yeah. It would have to be trail camp. Yeah. yeah. So that's the end of day one if it's a multi day trail. Consultation Lake or uh, Consultation? Consultation Lake is. Not accessible, really. You have to go downhill to get to it, whereas trail camp is right there. Yeah, good question. Okay, let's go to the next one. So here's a couple nice little items. You want to have a map. You'd like to have a compass. Here's the collapsible bottle I was telling you about. Doesn't take up much room, but can carry two to three liters. Please bring a good headlamp. Make sure you have fresh batteries. A watch, preferably with an altimeter, is really important. A knife is light is is always a useful tool to have along. Don't forget your camera. Don't forget your water purification. Um, is there a cell phone service on Mount Whitney? Yes, there is. On the summit, you can definitely get a signal. Um, I don't think we were able to get one at trail camp when I was there last time. That's the way off. <laughs> you mean for your party? Yeah. I really like those. We always use radios. So um, it's great for the sweep and the lead to both have a radio. That way everyone's in the middle. Then if you're concerned, hey man, where are you guys? Uh, we'll be there in 15 minutes, we have to stop at the waterfall or what have you. It's just great. It's a great way to go. Also, if you get the right types, they have weather. You can you can get a weather report on them. So a couple of items, a lot of these you're you're not gonna bring that. Um, these are all good things to have. Yeah, right. Okay, let's go on to the next one. So climbing gear, unless you're doing a technical route, you won't need these, but 
it's going to make your pack a lot heavier. Um, these are crampons, ice axes. Here's the down puppy I was telling you about. Um, if you are going that way, um, feel free to, to contact me or anybody. I have a lot. There's 20 different event leaders in SMC who probably all of them have climbed with me. A lot of us have climbed it multiple times. So we're glad to help. Go to the next one. Um, footwear is, is also an interesting topic because you certainly won't be carrying these up there, but this is a nice three season mountaineering boot. Um, can you pull that one off the wall, Gregor, or do I have it? Oh, they sold out? Okay. All right, awesome. So there are some boots that are kind of crossovers. Uh, it's nice to have a good stiff sole. This is my opinion, come from Mountaineer's perspective, um, to kick around in the talus and be able to walk on sharp granite. But I have some friends who do all their backpacking and running shoes. So, but they carry light packs. So I think that's kind of the difference is that I'm often shouldered with heavy packs because I'm carrying a lot of technical gear. And even when I go light, I still like my stiff boots. That's how I hike. Um, and my friend, you know, they climb in trail runners. So, oh, there's, there's, there's the limits. That's the limits. Okay. So this has got a sole that's fairly stiff, but um, that's really supportive. And uh, it's got great traction. It's totally waterproof. And someday, I hope that you come snow climbing or ice climbing or rock climbing, you can strap your crampons on here and you're good to go. Now, there are some people who hike in this boot on like the PCT and so on because it's really durable. This particular one is not the only one that's that type. This is what we call a three season mountaineering boot. So it's got a three quarter shank, it's waterproof, it's got a crampon compatible. Um, Little shelf in the back, and it's got a flexible ankle, so you can do French technique. And of course, it's stiff. Then you can get to heavy backpacking boots, which are about the same weight, um, and but less stiff. They'll have more flex. All the way down to trail runners. Anybody use trail runners or run trails in trail runners? <laughs> so they're awesome. I mean, they've got a nice, fairly stiff footbed to prevent against rocks. Um, some of them come with integrated gaiters. They're often waterproof and they have great traction. So the old leather hiking boot, well, there's lots of options. Yeah, a couple brands. Trail, trail runner, you might say. Like what's uh, on Lost <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's plenty of good ones, but they're kind of the time hit, huh? Yeah, yeah, they do sell those. Yeah. On the BCP trail, are there any no. no. So would those boots actually work on the Whitney Trail, like say during late summer? Yeah, they would. It'd be great. Now remember though, I you guys I, I'm telling climbing. you that this is from my perspective as, as a climber. So I I prefer stiff footwear. Um, I've gotten used to it. But I think that trail runners would do just fine too, as long as your pack is not too heavy. I think I'm concerned about the support underfoot and also on your ankle. Would you climb uh, windy mountain drought in April in the pre-season? Like Especially, that? yeah. that's what they're built for. Would yeah. you climb Shasta in May? Definitely. Definitely. I'd, climb Shasta. <laughs> <laughs> I'd climb all over the Sierra in this boot and backpack, and I do. <laughs> so yeah, three season mountaineering boots are bomb diggity for everything in the Sierra. <laughs> Scarpa makes one called the Charmos, a Solo, Garmont. They all make great three season mountaineering boots. Can I ask? Sure. You can just make a statement that no matter what shoe you choose, you shouldn't choose it on the day you go to the boot. Correct. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yeah. so That's train in it. You got to train in it. Yeah. And make sure it works for you. Um, my wife, especially, she changes her shoes all the time. My shoe really works. Yeah. And so, climbing, you know. Train in the shoes and try them out and take them back if they don't work. You That's know, right. I are these guys, I'm sure, will change out, you know, shoes for you. So. And so, you know, it makes such a big difference that I think it's probably the most important purchase you're going to make. More important than your backpack, your tent, your sleeping bag is your book, is your footwear. So spend as much time as you need to to get that dial and the sock combo too. Because if you don't have happy feet, you aren't going to be happy. <laughs> <laughs> One more last thing on my little soapbox is I've really enjoyed removable footbeds. 
I religiously use Superfeet for the last 15 years, all my footwear. There's another one called Soul, which also is great. But you know, if you have a race car with crappy seats, you know, that doesn't it doesn't help you. So get race car shoes and put great seats for your feet in there so that they'll be exactly molded. Even if you have to go to custom orthotics, I think it's worth it. So super feet are budget custom orthotics. I have a question. Earlier you said bring like two socks and two liners, and then you asked like people do liners or not. Are you saying like wear the two socks at the same time? Well, to, sometimes, I mean, okay. if you have a thin liner and a thick sock, yeah. think of all the combos you have. Okay. One liner, two liners, liner and sock, and liner sock, a sock sock. So it doesn't matter <laughs> how big or small <laughs> your foot or your boot are, mm -hmm. you can fit that distance. Yeah. And you can trade them out. So one key thing to do is to bring one sock and two liners. Mm -hmm. That way, while one liner is drying out, you can be sweating in the other one. Mm -hmm. And then at night, Put your liners in your bag and you trade them out the next day you've got your liners. Let's go to the next one. I don't think you're going to need these on Whitney just yet, but if you do, a standard um, 10 to 12 point mountaineering crampon is fine, and just a standard straight mountain axe will do it for you. They're easy to find. You can buy them used actually, and they'll be, should be good, but if you buy a brand new shiny type, you'll probably feel cooler. <laughs> <laughs> go to the next one. Okay, just standard mountaineering harnesses are great for all the routes on Whitney, unless they involve a lot, involve a lot of repelling, which none of them that I told you about tonight. And as far as ropes and runners and equipment, um, we have all of this stuff on loan on official trips in Sierra Mountaineering Club, so we can help you get going in that direction without having to put out any money except for footwear. We've got everything else, literally. So we'll help you. When you do buy your own, we'll help you figure out what to to buy and this is a great place to get it we get 28 percent off in this store all the time on all the gear in person 25 percent off online and there's often sales happen love that <laughs> right 35 percent off everything tonight right here okay everything he hasn't done that yet whatever clean out the place <laughs> <laughs> let's go to the next thing Let's go to the next one, Lenny. Okay, I'm gonna skip through this because this is too technical for Whitney, technically, but um, typical. But there's the gear, it's here carabiners and pickets. It's what we normally use in the mountain here throughout. Go to the next one. And some of that fancy, crazy climbing gears, high screws. Go to the next one. Okay, that's it. 824. Any questions or comments? I'm finished quite early. Go ahead. Yeah. If you know that if you have um, if you get if you have issues as you climb up the higher elevations, like you get headaches. Or oh right. Sickness, we didn't talk about that. What do you think about asking your doctor for some medication? Maybe. I think it's a good idea. Diamox is the one that I hear a lot of folks get. I think you can you can't get that over the counter. You do have to talk to a medical professional unless you are a medical professional. You have to talk to them to get it. Um, and that seems to work pretty well. I do know that it, I don't, um, not with Dymox, because I do pretty good at altitude. But I know that from my, some of our folks in our club that use it, that you have kind of metallic taste in your mouth. And I think that, it, um, what's the word, the same thing that coffee does to you, not it's Diuret diuretic. diuretic. Right, okay. So you have to drink extra amounts of water. That's all I know about Dymox. Can <laughs> you talk about the wag bags? Oh yeah. <laughs> they have a talk. Yeah. yeah. Can you demonstrate those? <laughs> so what they can you guess it, get this? Shasta and Whitney have different types of wag bags. <laughs> the Shasta type is a paper bag with kitty litter and a target in it, which is both more economical and more amusing. <laughs> the, the ones that they give you at Whitney are actually um, a an insert for a plastic RV toilet, but it's got a lot more niceties. Like they actually include toilet paper and sanitized wipes. It's a little tiny package. The toilet paper they give you is exactly this big. It's like five squares, I think. So I'd bring a little more, um, but it is it's adequate. It's got plenty of uh, plastic that you can double bag it. 
and just tie a real nice knot in it and you do your thing and you bring it back and throw it in the dumpster if you, you ever carry it down the mountain. <laughs> Is that one of the things you hook on to the outside of your Yeah, that's one of the things you hook on to the outside. So do you have to use the special No, no. But why do we do this? Because we all love Mount Whitney. I mean, all of us love Mount Whitney. So it's a good thing because otherwise you would see TP and group lining the trail all up and down that thing. So it's just something we have to do. So yeah, whatever system you, we want to use, just don't poop on them. Just bring them back. And urinate at least 200 feet away from water. That's that's the standard. <laughs> is that is that enough information about what I could keep going about? <laughs> Good question though. Have you Oh yeah, we, again we forgot to talk about AMS. So you asked about diamox. So what is it? Acute mountain sickness is a condition that comes upon you because of hypoxia. That's lessened oxygen in your blood. Okay. So if you have a lot of red blood cells and you're fit, you don't overexert, you're hydrated, and think positive, you should be able to kind of ride this curve as you climb up in altitude and lose oxygen in your blood, your body will start compensating. And how you know it's doing that, you'll feel shortness of breath, meaning that you'll be breathing more deeply and like breathing a lot. And then perhaps at the same time or around that time, you'll start to feel kind of a nauseous sort of headache and your appetite will decrease and you'll feel particularly lethargic. So if any or all of those happen to you, you are experiencing AMS. So the way how to get around it is train before you go, drink a lot of water. Make sure you're fully hydrated often, full time if you can. Drink before you go, drink during, drink after, drink at night. You're going to be losing water just from breathing. So you, minimum you have to replace it with at least three liters of water every day. Okay, so that's almost a gallon. Um, so drink a lot, train ahead of time, and then don't overexert yourself. That's something that that folks do that, that puts you at greater risk for AMS. So try to even out your exertion level. And if you do get AMS, there's only two solutions. One of them is that you can rest. When it happens to me, I, I lay down in my tent, I drink a lot of water, I lay down in my tent, I just close my eyes and I just relax and just breathe very deeply for like an hour and a half, and sometimes take a nap. And I also take aspirin, which I believe thins my blood. I'm not a medical professional, that's what I've been told. So that seems to help whether or not it's placebo, I don't know. <laughs> that seems to work. Um, some other, some folks take other sorts of pain meds or Diamox, I don't help you out. The second solution is to go down. So especially if you start vomiting, um, you're severely dehydrated, then you become exhausted, you can't sleep, you can't eat, you don't have enough energy, that can be a big downward spiral. So I have had to evacuate people off once, I had to evacuate someone off of Whitney because of AMS, and um, it was a pretty, it was a hard thing to do, because we had to get her down immediately, it was the middle of the night, there was snow on the route, and we had just climbed the summit. So after we got back to camp, we found out that she was severely AMS out, so we had to go. So watch your party, talk to each other, you know, drink a lot of water, work out ahead of time, maybe have dime off some. <laughs> Don't try to push it. If you're vomiting, it's probably time to turn around. But there's a lot of people who are hard-headed and think they can make it. And they get up to trail crest and they start puking. They're like, I'm almost there. But you still have a couple miles before you get to the top. So just be be uh, reasonable. <laughs> Don't get summit fever. Just be reasonable. It'll always be there. You can come back sometime if you're feeling that. Anybody? So, go ahead. Someone we were, uh, we were talking to said this to go down a little bit lower and, and wait and see if yeah. that helps and then maybe head back up. So if you've given yourself enough time to get where you're going, yeah. you may have time to slowly mm -hmm. get there. I tell you, this this is what we do. Those of you who are doing it in the day aren't going to like what I'm going to tell you. But <laughs> uh, having climbed the mountain you know, quite a few times, the best strategy is this. We go and camp at Whitney Portal first night. So we drive out there six to eight hours from this area. We camp at Whitney Portal the first night. Second night, we go up to about 11. Okay. Third day, okay, 
So one day, two day, third day, we climb the mountain and come all the way down and get our cars straight. So it's still a three day trip, but we spend most of that time going up. So that's one more reasonable itinerary. But please try to spend the night as high as you can before you attempt the Whitney Trail. Yeah, it's good. They have a store there. Um, they serve great hamburgers. Um, you got bathrooms with something to sit on, you know, <laughs> water. It's only twelve dollars a night, I think. So, so uh, do it. Going, Camp in Portland. Going three days, but what if you went to elevation every day and just hung out? Uh huh. And, and then place to go to ten thousand. Came back. And then went to um, Long Island, a couple of times. Well, you're losing a bunch of hours that your body could be ramping up its red blood, uh, red blood cell um, production. Yeah, it's not going to help you. I would just stay up there. Yeah, go to the Portland camp. If you can't, don't do anything else, that's at least a, if you wish a start. That's my advice on it. Other questions or Can you thoughts? talk a little bit about weather and what you're concerned about on the mountain when the clouds come in and yeah. when you should turn around? Well, so let's look at the, the, the topography. So you come from the east, right? And you're going to climb up through a valley with high mountains around you. So the weather's going to be obscured for all of the route until you get to Trail Crest. When you come to Trail Crest, speaking about the Whitney Trail, all the routes, because the most of them come from the east side. That's when you're going to get your first view of the weather. Because it all comes from either the west or the south, typically, in California. So it's a little bit of a, a bad deal for us. So. Whenever you get to the top, you need to take a critical look at how many hours do I have before that arrives. And you talk, typically, it's about an hour or two, depending on how fast the wind is blowing. There will almost always be clouds on the horizon. So you know from, from here where to go. If they're flat-bottomed or anvil-shaped or black, or if you already see precipitation coming, then decide what you want to do at that point. But yeah, you won't really know until you get to trail crest. Just I think the smartest thing to do, since we have so many good weather um, resources nowadays, is, well, I guess that depends on what, what day you get on the lottery. But if you can, try to plan a nice window of clear weather, obviously, so you don't have to worry about it. Yeah, lightning is particularly important. Um, I know I have friends who've been up there in August and were involved in a hailstorm. I know any time of year you can expect any kind of weather. So lightning comes and you just... What do you do for lightning? Get down as fast as you can, but if you're pinned, you need to get on your pack and then come down into a crouch like this so that you make yourself as small as possible when you're standing on something insulated. That's the lightning position. And apparently, don't go into the shelter. <laughs> <laughs> um, today I read that uh, Mr. Sierra is using thunder and lightning happens in the yeah, for sure. Not always, though. But And you can expect the weather typically to get worse as the evening comes on. And then in the morning, often in Sierra, it's clear. So another good reason to start early. It's cool. Um, the weather's usually better. And it, it's kind of a nice um, saying that you should eat your lunch on the summit or somewhere below. That's what you want to do. You want to be off the top right there. Probability of precipitation at the town to the is 10%, and then half the time on the summit there will be rain. Yeah. And then if it's 20%, probability of precipitation becomes the idea of rain. Let me give you um, two websites you can get the weather on the summit. One of them is Mountain Zone? No. Mountain Forecast. Mountain Forecast.com. Okay. It's got the uh, the mountain and it has the el it has the uh, forecast at each different elevation 10 12 14 and certainly Whitney is on that it's probably the first mountain that showed up mountain forecast.com the other one is NOAA N O A A and in NOAA they'll, they'll give you a topographic map that you can almost zoom in right down to a campsite and then put a marker there and it'll give you the geographic square will give you the forecast at that elevation for the days that you're going to be there and they go out about a week and they're they're pretty conservative so they'll usually give you the worst forecast they think is going to happen 
that's a good way to go. Right? And I found them to be pretty reliable. Of the two, I like no one better. Mountain forecast is pretty good too. So do check the weather. That's great. Anything else? Questions or comments? N O A A, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Association. What did I say? Associ yeah, administration, right, not association. <laughs> and it's okay. Okay, let's call it then. Thanks for coming tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Don't forget to take advantage of 35% off everything in the store. <laughs> Stop broadcasting.